an active photo photonix devices which can be integrated in silicon by using optical non linearities and modified material properties this interest encompasses also optical sensors or bio sensors and solar cells in silicon photonix uh, he is one of the worldwide recognized experts he organized several international conferences workshops and schools and is a frequently invited speaker uh, in uh, silicon photo photonics field so he manages several research projects both national and international he is an erc grantee and he is frequently invited reviewer monitor or referee for photonics projects by several grant agencies he is an author or co-author of more than 500 papers author of several reviews editor of more than 15 books author of two books and holds nine patents can photo next he is one of the worldwide recognized experts he organized several Moreover, he sits in the edges, editorial board and is a frequently invited speaker uh, in uh, silicon photo photonics field so he manages Moreover, he several sits in the editorial board of the national he is an ers the upri journal he is frequently invited and of the monitor and of the journals sensors and applied sciences several grant agencies optics and uh, lasers he is an advisory author board of, of glass to power and uh, of cybilla two italian start startup author of two books and holds nine patents yes he is fellow of the ieee spie and uh, sif and he holds an uh, h number of 59 according to scopus and uh, web of science and according to the google scholar uh, his uh, h index is 74 so uh, speaker is going to uh, uh, talk about professor uh, he going to talk about the past present and future of silicon photonics on his point of view so it's uh, end of the monitor now i am coming uh, professor lawrence pervesi uh, to give his uh, views on uh, silicon photonics uh, So now I will like like uh, hand over the session to Professor Lawrence Pervesi. Yes, Professor, he, fellow of the IEEE, SPIE, and uh, SIF, and he holds an uh, H number of fifty nine according to Scopus and uh, Web of Science, and according to Google Scholar, uh, his uh, H index is seventy four. So uh, uh, speaker is going to uh, uh, talk about Professor. Uh, uh, going to talk about. Uh, past present and future of silicon photonics on his point of view frequently so it's uh, end of the monitor now i am coming uh, professor lawrence pervesi uh, to give uh, his uh, views on uh, silicon uh, photonics uh, so now i will like like uh, hand over the session to okay <clears throat> so if you can give me the screen so that i can share my yeah, screen yeah. i will stop sharing it yeah okay. you can share it now okay perfect okay so thank you very much for the introduction and uh, uh, so also to uh, professor babu for the kind invitation to this uh, uh, very interesting uh, meeting So today I would like to uh, introduce you to my view of uh, silicon photonics and uh, before that uh, I would like to say where I'm living so I'm living in Italy Trento and uh, actually so Trento is a small town in the mountains so this is me this weekend so we really enjoy snow so this is a, a, this year we have a, a lot of snow but uh, let me go back to my Uh, talk. So uh, today the idea is to go through uh, the last 30 years of uh, silicon photonics and uh, uh, in doing that uh, I would like to start introducing what we did in the past, uh, what we are doing and wh what is the future according to my view of the field. And uh, since uh, uh, the time is uh, short uh, so I will Uh, 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 simply touch uh, two topics in the past. The first one is about core silicon. I will introduce core silicon and the reason why it is so important. It is core uh, silicon was in the field a, a real game changer. 
And then I, I will show one of our main results about uh, the activity we did in the uh, last years that was the observation of uh, uh, optical gain in silicon nanocrystal. Then I will pass to the state of the art of recent silicon photonics technology. That is the fact that uh, uh, you, you can integrate quite easily in silicon a, a full optical network. And then I will show you what are uh, the future in the fields and specifically two topics. One is about integrated quantum photonics and the second one is about neuromotive photonics. So let me start. Uh, 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 since uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, integrated circuit, I would like to show you what do we mean by integrated circuit. So this is a typical optical table with a lot of uh, uh, optical component, with a lot of uh, laser, with a lot of uh, uh, optical fibers. And what we aim to do is that to squeeze everything in, in a very small chip. And this is one of our chip that has a, a dimension that is much smaller than the typical uh, uh, dimension of uh, a small coin. And uh, uh, the reason why we want to do this is because we want to follow the paradigm of microelectronics. And if you look at the microelectronics as a, uh, the evolution of microelectronics as a function of the years, and you uh, uh, quote the number of functions that are integrated in a single chip, you see that the, those number has increased uh, uh, exponentially in the last year. And this increase is known as the Moore's law. Actually, if you look the same for integrated photonics, you see that uh, the number of components integrated in the chip are extremely small. Actually, nowadays we are here, so with the microelectronics, so the numbers is in excess of uh, 10 uh, billions of uh, different uh, functions per chip, while in uh, uh, integrated photonics, so we are only in the order of 10,000 uh, uh, functions per chip. And if we look at the reason uh, of this huge difference between photonics and uh, electronics, you uh, uh, can uh, uh, guess the reason. So you, you compare, so in this uh, table here, we compare the optics versus the integrated circuits so photonics with respect to uh, 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 microelectronics. And I should say that those, uh, uh, these slides are the original slides that I was used to uh, uh, present uh, at the end of uh, uh, last century. And so when we did the comparison, so we noticed at that time that in the semiconductor uh, uh, microelectronics, you, you have a single re repeatable building block that is the transistor, you have a uniform material base that is silicon, and you have a dominant manufacturing process. And so what you see here is that the integration is permitted by the use of standards. In photonics, you do not have a repeatable building block, you do not have a uniform material base, you do not have a manufacturing process. And here is the reason why we developed uh, silicon photonics. Because the idea of silicon photonics is to introduce standard, so a standardized technology for optical components manufacturing. And the idea is that to use the same paradigm, a single material as in microelectronics. And so what you want to do with silicon photonics is to uh, develop an integrated photonic circuit by using silicon, by using this very same CMOS uh, technology, and by reduce the number of uh, different uh, 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 components in, in the integrated circuit. And one component that is playing the role of the transistor in uh, photonics uh, is the silicon micro -ring. I will be back on this topic later on. And so silicon photonic is a technology where photonics devices are produced within standard silicon factory and with standard silicon process. And so you see that the, the key word here is the fact that we use standards. And in this way, by using standards, so we can leverage on the already deployed uh, 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 manufacturing for uh, manufacturing industry for microelectronics. So let me start with the past. And so I, I, I got my PhD from uh, 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 the Swiss Federal Institute in 1990. 
And at that time, I was working on three types of semiconductors. So this is one of my uh, review paper I wrote in 1994 and was about the uh, uh, optical properties of uh, aluminum gallium oxide. But exactly in that period, uh, 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 people were thinking that uh, the only way to uh, go to the uh, optoelectronic devices was to use gallium oxide or 3 5 semiconductor. So this is a very famous sentence that uh, state that if God wanted ordinary silicon to efficiently emit light, it would not have been given as uh, gallium oxide. So why do you have to go to silicon if you have gallium oxide? And so the advantages and the disadvantages of silicon in order to implement a photonics technology are the following. So the advantage is that silicon is transparent, meaning that where uh, optical fiber are transparent, where all the data come and telecom uh, technology is based. So in the third and in the second and third telecom window, 1.3, 1.5 microns, of wavelength, so silicon is transparent. And this is a big advantage. Then silicon, since it's the same material, is compatible with CMOS. It's a very low cost material. And what is even more important for uh, uh, integrated photonic, uh, it has a very high index contrast with respect to the silica cladding that we use to make uh, silicon uh, waveguides. In this way, so we can uh, increase can use a very large density of photonics component in uh, uh, silicon photonics. On the other hand, silicon has significant disadvantages. So being a, an indirect band gap semiconductor, being a centrosymmetric uh, material, on one side, it has no electrotic effect. On the other side, it lacks efficient light emission. And it, since it is transparent in in the wavelength region 1.3 to 1.5 micron, it, it is not able to detect light, so you cannot absorb light in the 1.3, 1.5 micron region. And since it has a very high uh, index contrast with respect to silica uh, 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 cladding, it has a very, uh, uh, it is very difficult to inject light into silica. And so those were the limitations we had to face. But the first, a big uh, 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 driving force to develop and to overcome those limitations is coming from the fact that uh, the microelectronics is reaching a, a stop point where uh, actually uh, uh, light and photonics and optical communication are needed. And so this was a huge uh, driving force in order to make silicon do what does what silicon is not good to do. And uh, uh, for this reason, uh, uh, silicon photonics technology has been uh, developed. In addition, uh, if you develop a photonic integrated circuit by using silicon, so then it is very simple to uh, uh, make convergence between computing and communication on the very same uh, optical platform. And this is the reason why silicon photonics was developed. And uh, one of the uh, first a very important experiment, experimental result was achieved by Lee Canham in 1990s, where he demonstrated that by using a, a very simple etching process, it is possible to carve in silicon quantum wires or quantum dots, and in this way, it makes silicon glow. And here you see what happens when you make uh, this material that is called porous silicon, and you shine blue light on top of porous silicon, you see that the material shows a bright orange uh, 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 luminousness. And so what is happening here? So let's go through the main limitation of silicon in terms of light emission. So what are the main problems with silicon? So the indirect band gap. In itself, the indirect band gap means that silicon has a low radiative recombination probability which means a long radiative lifetime in the order of few milliseconds. But this per se is not a problem because we have lasers that are based on uh, materials with uh, extremely long radiative lifetime. The problem with silicon is the fact that silicon is a semiconductor, which means that the free carriers move in silicon 
And while they are waiting to recombine radiatively, they can find a non-radiative recombination center. And therefore, due to the fact that the carriers are free to move, non-radiative recombination prevails, which means that the uh, internal quantum efficiency in bulk silicon is extremely uh, uh, low. So carriers prefer to recombine non-radiatively than to recombine radiatively. And so therefore, the way to overcome this limitation was to confine the free carrier and silicon. And this is the reason why low dimensional silicon has been proposed and as a way to beat the indirect band gap and avoid non-radiative recombination. So what you have to do is that you have to reduce silicon to very small nanocrystal. Here you see a, a TEM image of one of these small nanocrystal. You can recognize the different lattice plan. And what you also recognize is the size of the nanocrystal that is in the order of few nanometers. And as I, I, I have already uh, introduced before, so if you take these uh, uh, silicon nanocrystal and then you disperse them in a colloidal suspension and you shine a blue light on this uh, uh, suspension, you see that it starts to emit a very efficient room temperature visible light. Why do we see that? The first reason is because we are uh, uh, entering in the regime of quantum confinement. So by decreasing the size of the nanocrystal, you increase the transition energy. And so this is the reason why you move and you do observe visible emission from the silicon nanocrystal. So you are uh, witnessing a uh, uh, quantum confinement in your uh, nanocrystal. The second big reason you, uh, uh, which explains the fact that we do observe efficient room temperature luminescence is the fact that when we squeeze the wave function of electron and holes in the space in the space in the space uh, at the same time we broaden the same wave function in the uh, uh, reciprocal space and in this way so we increase the overlap between the whole wave function and the electron wave function this overlap increase cause that the radiative lifetime in silicon nanocrystal move from the few milliseconds to the few microseconds. And so we get a larger radiative recombination lifetime, which, uh, sorry, a, a, a smaller recombination lifetime. And this means that we do get a more efficient light emission from the nanocrystal. So, uh, uh, Lee Kahneman in this time was saying that it appears that we can still teach the old dot of semiconductor a few bricks. It just needs to be restructured on the nanoscale. And what we did at that time was to look for optical gain in silicon nanocrystal. And indeed, we started with a project that uh, was called, was a uh, project in 2000, was called Ramses, where the Ramses, apart from uh, indicating the uh, uh, um, Egyptian pharaoh uh, uh, was an acronym for radiation amplification by stimulated emission in silicon nanostructure. And so the aim was to see whether by using nanocrystal, by using quantum confinement, it was possible to turn a non-amplified uh, material into an amplified material. And the reason why optical gain is so important, this is actually the paper that we published in Nature, the reason why the observation of optical gain in silicon nanocrystal was so important is because optical gain is a crucial ingredient for making a silicon laser. And so actually, if you have a laser, uh, uh, what you need is a, a luminescence and amplifying active material that should be inserted into an optical cavity and then electric and injection should be used to pump the system. And so this was our uh, goal. Here I show you a, a few experimental evidence where we have demonstrated that indeed by using silicon nanocrystal it is possible to observe and to promote optical gain in the material. And what I want to uh, um, uh, uh, capture your attention on is in this graph here, where you see the absorption, you see the gain, 
and the gain spectrum, and you see the luminescence spectrum. And so you see that the silicon nanocrystal have a strong a stock shift between the absorption band and the emission band. And also you see that the gain characteristic is not overlapping the emission band. Here in this other graph, you see the uh, uh, transmission through the uh, uh, silicon nanocrystal layer as a function of wavelength for different path excitation. And what you see is that you start with uh, a, a curve that show uh, absorption, so the transmission is lower than one in your nanocrystal. And then when you increase the pump wavelength, so you induce population inversion and above threshold, you see that you have a gain spectrum here that is positive, meaning that the light that is going in is uh, larger, uh, sorry, that means that the light that is going in, in, in the nanocrystal is amplified so that the transmitted light is larger than the intensity of the light that, that was used. And so in order to try to explain these observations, so we uh, claim a four level models for the optical gain in the nanocrystal. And this uh, four level model is essentially based on two uh, levels that are uh, excited by optical pumping that we have a very fast relaxation and therefore we do get a, a population inversion of this entry intermediate state with respect to the uh, uh, low uh, uh, energy state entry. And so this is the gain transition, while this one is the absorption transition. And if you look at the uh, configuration coordinate diagram, you see that it is possible to explain this four level model by uh, assuming the presence on the surface of the nanocrystal of localized defects that after excitation they do uh, uh, get a strong relaxation. And so these localized defects here were by the silicon oxygen bonds where oxygen is the material that passivated the surface of the nanocrystal explain the gain of surface. So once you have the gain, so the second passage is to uh, demonstrate that you are able to optically inject, sorry, to electrically inject the material so that you can get efficient uh, uh, lasing from the system. However, unfortunately, the fact that the nanocrystals are formed in a, a dielectric matrix, so in a silicon oxide matrix, make electrical injection very difficult through the uh, system. And here I do show some result of uh, 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 silicon nanocrystal based LEDs, where we do inject current through uh, uh, this electrical probe and we collect the emission light through the optical fiber. And what you see here is the increase of the emitted optical power as a function of the injected current density. And now, if you look at the numbers at the values here, you see that the overall power efficiency in our uh, LEDs is lower than. Uh, uh, 0.2%. So, unfortunately, despite the fact that the uh, non crystal uh, do show efficient room temperature luminescence, despite the fact that uh, the non crystal do show optical gain, unfortunately, it is not possible because of the limitation of the system to efficiently electrically inject the uh, 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 current into the non crystal. And therefore, so it is not possible, at least up to now, it is not possible to actually make a, an injection silicon laser by using the nanocrystal. However, at that time, I was also claiming the fact that silicon would be the photonic material of the third year. And the reason why I was saying that it was because uh, I was predicting that by using silicon, it is possible to achieve a full integration of electronics and optics on the same device. And indeed, this was what actually happened. So here you see as a function of the year, the different steps that the community of silicon photonics has followed. And what do we see here is that at the end of last century, so we have demonstrated the fundamental device, and then we do observe a very huge uh, increase in the uh, technology by which we demonstrate the different discrete device 
we demonstrate hybrid integration, monolithic integration, and nowadays we are uh, 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 really developing heavily integrated electronic and photonic circuits. So, conclusion of this of the past is the fact that, uh, as uh, Arnold Penzias, which is who was the Nobel laureate uh, uh, in 1978, was saying is that when you find yourself competing with silicon tone, the same uh, 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 conclusion was reached by other people. For example, here, Patrick Hennis was saying that the lesson in the silicon photonics field could be also break in, break in two ways. The first, the first silicon, despite being imperfect, always win, or traditional embedded solution with constant incremental improvement, always win. And uh, just to demonstrate that uh, actually these technologies, so the silicon photonics technology, is able to uh, fulfill the premise we are saying, I would like to show you uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, most heavily integrated photonic devices that uh, have been demonstrated. So here I, I show you how it is possible to enable an optical network on a chip by using silicon microresonator. And this is the state of the art of the technology nowadays. So what the a silicon microresonator is. So you take a waveguide, so where light is confined, and then you round the waveguide and you make a circle. And now what you have is that the light is traveling inside this uh, uh, circumference and is coming back to the initial point. And uh, now, if you want to sustain this optical uh, signal inside the ring, what you have to do is that after a round trip, uh, so the light is coming back with a zero phase difference. And therefore, so you have a resonance condition that explained that dictated what is the wavelength that is able to be accommodated within this uh, silicon uh, uh, micro ring? And these resonant conditions state that the effective index of the mode that is propagating in the micro ring times the circumference of the micro ring should be equal to a multiple of wavelength. And if this condition is satisfied, then you can propagate an optical field within the micro ring. Now, if you couple waveguides at the edge of the micro ring, at the side of the micro ring, like in this way, and you approach the waveguide to the micro ring, you may have an overlap between the optical mode in the waveguide with the optical mode that is resonant in the micro ring. And in this way, due to this optical overlap, you transfer power from the waveguide to the micro ring. Clearly, this transfer of power can be only uh, done if the wavelength of the light satisfies the resonance condition. Now you can uh, couple another waveguide to the other side of the micro ring, which is nearby enough uh, to get the same coupling efficiency as you uh, have got in, by this first waveguide. And so in this way, you can transfer the light to the micro ring and then to these other waveguides. And so you can get uh, what is called an, an add drop feature by which you send an input light here. Depending on the wavelength, you can drop the light in this channel here. Or if the wavelength is not resonant with the ring, so the light is not coupled to the ring, and so the light is going through. And so in this way, by controlling the resonance condition or by controlling the wavelength of the light, what you can do, you can switch your light signal from this output port here, that is the true port, to this uh, drop port here, that is the other uh, uh, um, output port of the system. And so in this way, you have an optical switch that by controlling the wavelength of the light, you can send the signal in this direction or you can send the signal in this other direction. And what is nice here is the fact that the resonance condition is essentially dictated by the refractive index of the ring. And so if you change the refractive index of the ring, you can change also the wavelength that is dropped or that is switched from this port here to that port there. And in silicon, it's very easy to control the refractive index by simply heating up the ring. And now 
So what we can do is that we can develop by using these micro rings, we can develop reconfigurable optical network on the chip. So the idea here is to make a device that is able to perform a, a node function in the uh, optical communication uh, network. And what you can do is that you can uh, 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 reconfigure this uh, uh, node by simply controlling the resonance condition of the different uh, uh, micro rings that you place in uh, this array. And the idea is to use silicon photonics to replace uh, the actual system that are deployed in the field that are those based on uh, 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 micro electromechanical uh, system. So what, what you have in nowadays uh, uh, optical nodes, you have a system of mirrors that are readdressed in order to send the signal from a fiber to another fiber. So the problem with this system is the fact that uh, it is massive, it is large, it is expensive, it costs a lot. And even more uh, uh, critical is the fact that it takes time to send, to switch the signal from a fiber to the another fiber. So typically the time is taken by uh, uh, the need to align very carefully the mirror uh, in, in such a way that the light signal is sent in the right fiber that uh, you, you need uh, to address. And this time is in the order of few milliseconds. And so we were proposed to develop a system by using silicon photonics that it was able to be uh, 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 less expensive, less uh, large, and much faster than the actual system on the market. And so we did, uh, and we developed an array of micro ring resonators uh, by which we control the resonance position of each one of these micro rings by thermally actuating the micro ring. And in this way, so we are able, depending on the color of the light, so we are able to let the light to go through or to switch to a given direction. So this is the idea. So the, the idea is to use this uh, 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 system to, to be able to switch the light from one channel to another channel. And uh, uh, here it is the kind of, uh, uh, I will not enter into the detail, but this is the kind of integrated photonic circuit that we have developed within this European project. So we have more than 1,000 photonics components. Each one of these photonic components is electrically controlled. And so we develop a, also an ASIC uh, circuit in order to uh, uh, control the photonic component. And the ASIC circuit had more than 2,000 electronic uh, different blocks. So we were able to address 48 different channels. And what is even more important, the overall dimension of the chip was less than 30 millimeters squared of uh, uh, area. So here it is the uh, kind of electronic control. And this is the design of the, of the chip where you see the, uh, in orange, you see the photonic integrated circuit. And on top of the electronic photonic circuit, so we have uh, bonded the electronic integrated circuit. And here are the wafer produced by Lakin in Grenoble. So this is the single chip. And what you see here in the single chip in the center part here, you see the micro ring array. And uh, then uh, you, you develop also the electronic integrated circuit. So the ASIC, so this one was uh, uh, fabricated by ST microelectronics. And then you bond together the photonic chip and the electronic chip. And here you have the two chips that are bonded together. And, and then you wire the chip and so you perform both the electrical wiring as well as the optical wiring. So optical wiring means uh, you take optical fibers and you glue the optical fiber to the chip. Here is the uh, actual image of the chip where you see the integrated photonic circuit on top of which you have the electronic integrated circuit. And here you see the bundle of optical fibers, so 16 optical fibers that are exiting from the chip. And once you have packaged the, the circuit, so you put the, the uh, packaged circuit in, in a board, uh, so you add some electronics to control the address logic and so to control the reconfiguration of the optical network. Here you see all the optical fibers, here you have the connector, and then you give the integrated circuit to a PhD student, a 
that by using an external laser is testing the device. And uh, everything is working, so you can now uh, 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 test the device on a uh, optical on, on a traffic line, so in an optical transmission experiment. And what is here shown is the fact that you can switch quite easily your uh, signal from one channel into channel to another into channel. And by and you can do that uh, at a very high speed. So these are uh, curves uh, uh, that have been recorded at 25 gigabit per second. And so what I have shown you is the fact that actually, so you are able to integrate uh, uh, together a silicon photonics with the silicon microelectronics to perform a significant uh, uh, function needed by the uh, optical communication. What is the future? So this is the state of the art. What is the future? So in order to uh, 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 look for the uh, uh, future direction, so uh, uh, clearly as a silicon uh, 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 physicist, I uh, need to look at the most low. And if you look at the most low, you see that the, the size of the uh, uh, transistor is nowadays reaching a, a very ultimate limit, that is the atomic uh, limit. And therefore, this uh, uh, increase in the resolution, so plus limitation in the evolution. And this limitation in the evolution of the computing of the system uh, uh, performance uh, is uh, uh, in phase uh, worldwide. And there are several suggestions that uh, 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 are indicating that, the, uh, uh, that there is a, a strong need to change the paradigm over which the actual computers are based. And so here is, for example, a prediction that has been done by IBM in uh, 2015. And what they are saying is that if you want to increase as a function of failure, the overall system performance, once you have developed one nanometer uh, 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 long uh, transistor, then you have to drastically uh, uh, change the uh, 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 computational parity. So you have to go to new physics in order to make a uh, 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 computer. And what they are suggesting is to use neuromorphic computing on one side and quantum computing on the other side. So the future is quantum and brain inspired. And so here is where we want to move with silicon photonics. Uh, quantum means uh, developing integrated quantum photonics for quantum computing. Brain inspired means uh, trying to mimic what happened in the brain by using silicon photonic circuits. So in this way, so you want to integrate neural network in silicon photonics. So let me start with quantum photonics. So quantum photonics is uh, 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 the uh, try to integrate the quantum physics and to use quantum physics in photonics devices. And so to do that, uh, you have to develop a, a chip where you have a generation of quantum state of flight, a stage where you do perform the quantum manipulation, and then finally you need to detect the uh, uh, qubits that you are developing. And so what we are doing in this field is we are trying to develop a single photon source. So we are trying to provide single photons, very few photons for the quantum computer. And so in order to do that, so we use the concept of heraldi. And so the, 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 the idea is the following. So what you want to have is that you want to have that each state of life is uh, uh, with uh, a single photon. So you have a source of a very pure single photon. So you do not want to have many photons that are produced in your sources. And to do that, we use the concept of random. So the idea is very simple. So you generate a correlated in time pair of photons, then you measure one of the two photons, and this photon that is detected around the presence of the other photon in the quantum circuit. And so in this way, you are sure to have one single photon that is propagating and it is manipulated in your quantum circuit. And so the idea to implement this is to have a correlated photon pairs. 
And so the idea in selecting photonic is to use four wave mixing to generate these correlated photon pairs. And in this four wave mixing, what we have is that we have the two photons annihilate and then spontaneously uh, generated a pair of photons at the very same time. So they are strongly correlated in time with two energies that should satisfy the energy conservation as well as the momentum conservation. And so what those two uh, newly generated photons typically are called the signal photon and the idler photon. And since the requirement of the energy conservation, what typically you have is that uh, the signal photon and the idler photon are embedding the fan photon here. And so what we want to do is that we want to use silicon photonics in order to generate the single photons in such a way that by measuring one of the two, so we can arrive the presence of the other. In order to uh, 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 distance, make uh, the generation of the idle photon enough distance so that uh, from the fan photon, so what we, what we use is that we exploit the phase function in a specific way. And so typically people is using intramodal uh, uh, um, for way mixing, meaning that the pump photons are on the very same mode as the signal and idler photons. And so if you look at the uh, 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 phase matching condition, this means that the effective index of the pump of the signal and of the idler photon are the same, and which means that the energy the frequency of the pump, the signal, and the other should be very similar uh, 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 because of the need to conserve the uh, uh, phase of the, in, the, in the process. So that means that the efficiency in the generation of the idle photon is very near to the wavelength of the pump. However, if you use intermodal, so if you use different modes for the pump and the signal photons, so now you can relax this very strict a, a relationship between the pump and the signal and the idle uh, uh, photon frames. And so in this way, so you can excite, you can generate the photon very far away from the pump. And this is very useful because in this way, you can very clearly isolate your generated photon with respect to the pump photon. So here is a schematics of the uh, kind of uh, 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 photonic circuit that we have developed. So here is the uh, result where we do have pump at 50-50 and we do get efficient uh, 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 idler photon at uh, 1280, that is very far away. And, uh, uh, and therefore we have performed the experiment in order to demonstrate that indeed we have a, a, a single photon. And so we have measured uh, uh, the idler photon to around the signal. And this is the experiment we did there. So we perform a coincident experiment. So uh, we develop, uh, uh, we, we perform a three photon coincidence. And so the around photon uh, signal, the presence of the signal photon. And if you have a single photon here, so the two uh, 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 detector never click at the same time. And so if you have zero delay between the three uh, detector here, what you expect is to measure a very small signal, while if you have an increased delay, so your photon can go here or your photon can go there, and so you have a strong signal. And indeed, this was observed. So we do observe and we do prove that uh, indeed we have a single photon that are generated by using this mechanism. And, uh, and therefore, so we uh, also demonstrated that this uh, uh, photon source is near ideal. So the quality and the purity of the single photon state that uh, has been uh, uh, produced is extremely good. And uh, 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 to demonstrate this, uh, so we perform an experiment of quantum interference between two identical source of uh, pure single photons integrated in the very same uh, uh, silicon photonic chip. And what you do see here is that you get a very high visible uh, uh, quantum interference, which means that indeed you have uh, produced indistinguishable single pure uh, uh, photons by using this process of uh, uh, intermodal uh, four-way mixing. 
this is a very good result because these, uh, those sources are suitable for uh, uh, developing a, a quantum computer by using uh, integrated silicon photonics. So what's next? So this is one direction. So the other direction is neuromorphic computing. And in neuromorphic computing, what we are doing is that we are trying to develop a, a computational scheme which imitates the way the brain thinks. And so in this project, what we are want, what, what do we want to do is that we want to uh, leverage on the performance of the brain as well as on the power efficiency of our brain. And so the idea is to really try to mimic what is happening in the brain. And we have also a, a, a more important ambition. What we want to do is that we want to integrate on the very same chip both the photonic as well as the uh, neurons that we find in, uh, uh, in a brain. And so in, in this uh, uh, project, so we are developing the biological part, we are developing the silicon photonics part in order to merge those two parts together and uh, uh, demonstrate a hybrid, hybrid neural network where at the same time the living neurons as well as the photonics uh, circuit do compute together. And so in order to do that, so what we are doing is that we are developing light in this picture so we are developing, developing silicon photonic circuit and we are placing on top of the silicon photonic circuit the neurons. So let me show you where we are with respect to the biology. And the first uh, question that, that we had was how it is possible to transduce a signal from the photonic circuit to the neuronal circuit. So from the photonics part to the neurons? And the answer is, why don't we use optogenetics? And optogenetics is a technology by which you introduce light-sensitive protein in the membrane of the neurons so that you can control the, uh, by using light the electrical activity of the neurons itself. And by choosing the different proteins, light-sensitive proteins, and by choosing the different uh, uh, color of the light, so you can excite the neurons or you can inhibit the neuronal activity. And so here is an example of the experiment we did. So this is the, a, a, a network of neurons that have been uh, genetically modified by, you, by introducing light-sensitive proteins. And what we are doing here is that we are stimulating this a, 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 a few neurons here, and we are looking by imaging the calcium activity, we are looking the activity of the neurons. And what we see here is that by pumping these neurons, so we are able to uh, uh, transmit a signal from this neuron here to that neuron there. So by using optogenetics, so we can indeed uh, influence the activity of our neurons here. On the other side, so the, the question is also, how can we do a network, a neuronal network by using photonics? So the question is, how can we integrate the neuromorphic computer in a photonic chip? And this is the actual activity we are doing now on the photonic counterpart. This is the chip that we have developed. So the chip is packaged, is tested, and here are a, a, a few concepts that we have integrated. So we have we are using uh, uh, um, we are using micro ring resonator in order to uh, make a, a concept a, a neural network that is based on the uh, reservoir computer. And so by using this uh, uh, circuit here, so what we were able was to demonstrate was a, a photonic neural circuit which is able to perform some functions. For example, here is a result where our photonic neural circuit is able to recognize a heater in a, a optical uh, a transmission signal. And so the idea is to be able to recognize uh, this specific sequence of symbols uh, in an optical transmission signal. And so what we did was to use a four uh, a, a reservoir computing with four uh, 
micro ring resonator. So everything is run at very high speed. So that means 20 gigabit per second. And here is the outcome. So here you see in blue line, so you see the sequence of uh, input signal. For example, here we have a sequence of a zero, a one, a one, a zero, a one, a one, a zero, zero, one. And what we need to do is that our uh, uh, photonic neural circuit has to rise a flag uh, each time we see a one, zero, one, zero, one. And this is actually what is happening. You see here, so this is the output of the photonic circuit, so the orange light. And you see that nothing happened unless uh, a sequence of one, zero, one, zero, one is input into the neural network. And so when this sequence is uh, uh, inserted in the, in the photonic neural circuit, so you see that the answer, the output from the neuron is uh, a flag that say, hey, I have recognized the I, the ego. The same happens here. You see a sequence of one, zero, one, zero, one, and the flag is turning four. Here, where we have one, 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 no flag, here, where we have one, zero, one, zero, one, the flag is right. And so we have demonstrated that indeed by using silicon photonics, it is possible to integrate the, the uh, uh, photonic neural networks. On the other side, we have shown that it's possible to influence the activity of neurons by using light. And so our next step is to merge those together in order to make a chip that is able to perform at the same time a, a, a functional uh, 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 recognition activity by using uh, 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 an hybrid method. So this is the ultimate goal, and we are working in this direction. So here are my conclusion. So I hope to have shown you that silicon photonic is the way to take place with the computational and communication needs. That the limitation of nowadays microelectronics is facing. I hope to have shown you that silicon photonics allow to integrate novel functionalities at the chip level, and you can move to quantum photonics on one side, or you can move to neuromorphic photonics on the other side. And uh, I am quite confident to close this uh, 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 talk by saying that silicon photonics is the technology of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So before uh, uh, concluding, I would like to acknowledge the people in my lab that, that have performed most of the work that I've shown you. I need also to acknowledge the uh, uh, sponsoring uh, agency that are uh, uh, providing the funds to perform this uh, uh, research. So on one side, the European Commission through these two projects, so the Epicus project and the QRN project, I would like also to thank the collaboration that we have with uh, uh, India in the Indio Trento uh, project for advanced research. I would like to thank the uh, local initiative QNTN, where we are aiming to develop quantum science and technology in our uh, 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 province. Uh, as far as the new morphic photonics activity, I would like to thank the European Commission for the backup the LP and the island project, the uh, Italian government for the PEN project, and the University for the Brain Deep, which is the Brain Network Dynamics Initiative. Uh, here, there are a few references. If you are interested to go through uh, uh, the past and the present of silicon photons, not the future, because the future uh, has been to be invented. And uh, uh, I conclude by saying that I'm actually looking for PhD students to join our lab in quantum and neuromorphic activity. And said so that, so I'm, I'm done, and I do thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, one person, there is two questions in the chat box. Let me read it. One question is uh, from Govindan. 
the use of germanium doped semiconductor is alternate for silicon chips uh, i should not say alternative i should say complementary so actually i had no time to go through but germanium is actually used in silicon photonics for several functions so the first one and the most important one is detection so nowadays you can integrate in silicon photonics uh, uh, detectors by using germanium and actually uh, rpds so avalanche photodiode made by uh, a silicon and germanium are more performant than the b35 counter another use of germanium in silicon photonics is to make the laser because there are a, a few observations that the, the, uh, the joint action of the strain, so the uh, uh, stress that formed with, due to the lattice mismatch between germanium and silicon, uh, uh, um, influenced the uh, uh, band structure of the germanium layer and uh, turns germanium into a direct band gap semiconductor. And there are a few observations that indeed you can make a laser by using germanium. So germanium is complementary to silicon. It's not uh, 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 in, in contraposition. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. And uh, another question asked by Sarishwaran. His question is, uh, could you please explain how and where neuromorphic computer photonic chip is used? Okay, so neuromorphic computing or neural network is the uh, 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 platform where artificial intelligence is implemented. So concept like machine learning, concept like deep learning, concept like artificial intelligence are uh, implemented in uh, uh, electronics. Uh, uh, however, electronics nowadays has limitation because of the architecture. And so there are uh, 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 several uh, 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 different uh, uh, developments which show that if you integrate directly, you change the architecture of the electronic circuit by implementing at the uh, chip scale the uh, uh, concept of the uh, uh, neural network so that you can make a much more efficient computation. So everything that is based on artificial intelligence needs a, a platform where you can uh, uh, implement uh, uh, those software. And what we are trying to do is that uh, to develop a very similar uh, uh, platform, not using electrical current, electrical signal, but by using photonic signal. And by using photonics, so you uh, gain in terms of speed, because in electronics, you can run the electrical circuit at a frequency of few gigahertz in photonics. So we can go up to 100 gigahertz, even 400 gigahertz. So you can increase uh, uh, the, the, the uh, operating frequency. The second big advantage of photonics is wavelength. Uh, uh, the fact that you can use many more different wavelengths. So dense division multiplexing, the success of optical communication, you can also do the same in, uh, uh, in neuromorphic photonics. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. And another question in the chat box asked by Ruby Thomas. Uh, his question is kindly explain some informative ideas of fabricating nanomembrane in flexible intelligent photonics. Okay, so uh, flexible photonics, however, is not implemented in silicon, but typically is, uh, is implemented in plastic or in polymeric, uh, 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 in a plastic or polymeric platform. So here the concept is to change drastically the material. So silicon is a hard uh, material that is not really uh, very well suited for uh, plastic uh, or for flexible electronics. So as far as I know, I mean, for flexible electronics, you have to go to organics or polymeric material or plastic material, not, not actually silicon. Okay, uh, there are two participants who would like to have a discussion with you, Prof. Uh, Shukdev Pandey, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, you can proceed. Uh, 
hello, Professor Lorenzo. Uh, I, I really thank you for giving this enlightening lecture. And I would like to say that this has been intellectually one of the most scintillating lectures of East M21 till now. And uh, probably I was not able to follow everything. So I have a few basic questions to ask you. Uh, so the first one is about like, uh, when we uh, reduce the silicon size to nanometers or like into the quantum range, you said that the blue light uh, uh, becomes red or like orange through through uh, the silicon mm, material. So, and then you showed like a graph where uh, the size and the uh, transmission energy was being compared. So basically when we have the red shift, it's more like the energy should go down. But in the graph, I think it was the other way around if, if I'm not mistaken. Like with reduction in size, the energy was going up. It was like this uh, exponential decay kind of a graph. Uh, so, the, so thank you very much for the nice word. I, I'm happy that you appreciate my lecture. And uh, uh, so the, the uh, um, effect you are referring to is the quantum confinement of free charges of electrons and holes in the <laughs> quantum dot. So what happens is that when you reduce the size of the quantum dot, you increase the confinement energy. So the overall transition energy is going to increase. And so what happens in silicon is that you move from the typical band gap of silicon of 1.12 electron volt, you enter into the visible range. So you go up to 1.6, 1.8, 2.2, and so on and so forth, depending on the size of the nanocrystal. I see. Okay, thank you. So my next question is about the silicon rings. So you showed that how we can couple uh, the waveguide with the ring. So like, are the, are the waveguide and the ring being physically like uh, joined together? Or like, how is the coupling happening? How does like the signal yeah. transfer from the waveguide into the ring? And also, can we use like uh, pulse strains rather than going for the uh, resonance or like the waveguide match, uh, wavelength matching, can we work with pulse strains? Okay, so the, the first question is, so the, the idea is the following. So if you take two waveguides and you approach the two waveguides, as you approach the waveguide, you have that the optical mode in one waveguide overlap with the optical mode in the other waveguide. And so that means that by approaching the two waveguides, so you can transfer the power from one waveguide to the other waveguide. So typically what you do is that you put the two waveguides very nearby. And mm -hmm. when I say nearby, it means that the typical width of a silicon uh, waveguide is, is 500 nanometers. And the gap uh, between the two waveguides, so the waveguide and the rig, can be as small as 100 nanometers, 150 nanometers. So if so I may interrupt in between, uh, sir, what about the internal, total internal reflection? Are we not following that law of total internal reflection here? Are we allowing the light to like go outside the medium? This is what ha actually happens, okay? okay? So that means that if you confine and then you have that the, the light spread over. So you have the evanescent tail of the optical mode that exit from the waveguide. And so are right. those evanescent tails that you overlap one with the other. Right, so, okay. And, and about the pulse strains, if you could use like pulses. Uh... So this is something that we have studied quite a lot. So if you are interested, you can drop me an email and I can send you the, 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 the papers on that. So the, sure, the, the sure. fact that the, those devices do work with pulse light as well. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, I've shown you the, the working of the optical network, and in that yes. optical network, so we had a, 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 a pulse uh, train that were, was as fast as 25 gigabit per second. So meaning that the single pulse was only a few nanoseconds long. Right, interesting. So, so two more quick questions. I, I asked the organizers to please give me like one more minute here. Sir, about correlated photons, uh, you said that we need to develop like correlation between photons. Now you were using pump photons one after the other. So there was like a difference in time of the pumping. So now the, the uh, idle and the supply photons will be coming out with a time difference. Now, is the time difference okay? Like, can they still be called correlated if they are having difference of time? No, so what happens is that you have two photons, okay, mm -hmm. the pump photon do right. interact and spontaneously decay in a signal in the idle photon. 
And this mm. uh, 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 phenomena happens at the same time. So you I have see. a generation okay. of the idler and signal photo in the four wave mixing process that occurs exactly at the same time. So we say that the two photons are uh, entangled. See, so great. So, so, what, so the last question is about that 10101. So you said that uh, whenever that sequence will come, so we will have a prediction, but somehow in the prediction graph, that was happening at the first one and not at the last one. I was expecting it to happen after 10101, but it no, was happening. You right. Yeah, you are right, but you have to follow the sequence. I mean, so this was the time that moved. So the origin so was on the other side? No, no, the origin was correct, but the, the fact is that you are uh, providing to the system that has a memory, the sequence of one, zero, one, zero, one. And then right. after the last one, so you mm -hmm. get a spike of right. uh, the either recognition. But in the so graph, it, it was that first in the time. Yeah, yeah. But you, you have to consider that you have a sequence, okay? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the last one is the first yes. that is input to the to the neural network. Ah, uh, okay. It's okay. like a, a trace on a, a on a an oscilloscope. Right. Okay, sir. Okay, I, I will I will probably follow your papers and understand better. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shukdev. Uh, uh, one more participant, uh, Amiras Dongo. Amiras, could you please unmute yourself? Excuse me. Amiras, uh, you please unmute yourself and uh, you can ask the speaker. Amiras. Amiras. I think, okay. Uh, participants, if you have any questions, please type in the chat box. Okay, Prof. Uh, on behalf of our college management and uh, principal, head of the departments, uh, faculty, faculty members, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to you uh, for this wonderful lecture, kind of a lecture, especially in the field of uh, silicon photonics. We thank you for. Uh, we thank you to. Prof. We hope that we will bring you soon to our campus once this pandemic has been over. You are very Thanks. welcome to our campus. Yeah, we will plan a kind of one day, uh, kind of international conference very soon. We will definitely bring you to our campus. I, I would love. Okay, thank you very much for thank you. the opportunity to present my work to this yeah. very interesting conference. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Bro. Thank you. Thanks Have a, a good lot. day. Bye bye. 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 Uh, participants are requested to fill the feedback form uh, for the session three, uh, which is mentioned in the chat box. The next session will be begin sharply at uh, uh, 3 p.m. Professor Monica Inklesko from uh, National Institute of Material Physics, Romanio, uh, will be the speaker for the next session. So the next session is the fourth session of today. So kindly fill the form and please be patient. At sharply three o'clock, we will start this session.